In this lesson, I'm going to discuss memory assets shared between threads and managing data that has to flow between them. A lot of programmers shy away from multi-threading in software because of the problems that arise when multiple threads all contend for the same resource. Sometimes the issues arise because of the complexity of the algorithms involved in solving a particular problem, but we needn't look at those advanced cases to see the problems. We can look at something closer to home, configuration data. I've worked on a number of highly configurable applications over the years, and configuration management on a large scale is always a problem. Let's start with read-only assets. The easiest scenario to manage revolves around static read-only data that can be loaded at initialization and simply handed out on demand throughout the runtime. One needn't worry about simultaneous access from multiple threads because even if a particular read or copy operation isn't atomic, the value being read doesn't change, so there's no harm. Now, if your customer can suddenly decide not to apply business rule number 51 in the middle of this afternoon, as opposed to every Wednesday or every even-numbered Tuesday, because you can code for that, then you have to think about how to obtain that data. Synchronizing access to that data doesn't have to be the answer. You might choose to issue a query to an SQL database or to a configuration web service each time the question arises as to whether or not to apply business rule number 51. That removes the issue of data synchronization to someplace outside of your code, and there's nothing wrong with that. Whether or not calling outside your application meets the performance goals of the system is something you'll have to determine on a case-by-case -case basis. At this point, we might revisit the reason for managing access to data in the first place. In multi-threaded applications, especially those providing web services, most operations aren't atomic. That is, they don't necessarily complete without being interrupted by another thread of application code. Assignment operators for classes make copying class objects look like copying integers, but that's a convenience for the coder. Under the hood, we know it's a lot more complex than that. A multitasking, multi-threaded operating system interrupts operations as it deems necessary opening the possibility that shared data might be written to and read from at the same time. A data reader might have copied half of an object's fields, been interrupted by a data writer updating those same fields, only to resume the copy operation and end up with a corrupted object full of mismatched data. That, at the very least, implies some sort of logic error might be made. At the worst, it leads to exceptions and application crashes. So, in general, we don't allow simultaneous reading and writing of common data, and we just don't allow simultaneous writing of common data. One might allow simultaneous read-write operations where there is no data overlap, but something of that level is beyond the scope of this lesson and this course. Coming back to managing configuration data particularly, You'll remember that I mentioned reading from a SQL database or querying a web service as possible choices for acquiring data without synchronizing access. You might also simply read from a local memory cache as well, and code requiring this data shouldn't need to know how the rest of the application acquires the data. This is a good place to write an abstract configuration interface, either as a library or class, so that you're free to change what happens behind the scenes as the application evolves through time and changes in requirements. This is also a good place for me to mention that the abstracted interface always hands back copies of data, not the actual data. Handing over the address of a string or character array or pointer to a data object is asking for someone to make a mistake and modify the data pass back copies. If someone two releases from now accidentally tries to write to the configuration data, it won't corrupt the original data cache. Now let's talk about writable assets. You can't all get in there at once. Assuming that the design you have absolutely requires synchronized read-write data access, you have two options, critical sections and mutexing. I've separated the two terms because Linux developers will use mutexes only. Windows developers have a specific critical section API that they can use in addition to mutexing. You could go low level here to semaphores and other lock types, but there's no need. Modern operating systems take care of that for you. You just need to use the capabilities they already provide. I've included an example mutex class in the code that accompanies this course that you can use to educate yourself on the general principles. 
like most educational examples, it's not production-ready code, so I'm not making any warranties or guarantees that it will work for your particular needs. You should learn from it and write something that works in your application. I'll let you look at the low-level mutexing code whenever you're ready. What I'm going to look at now is how you make mutexing automatic inside the classes in your application that require synchronized access. There are two ways to do this. Either write a helper class or derive from a class that provides the infrastructure and locking methods itself. Before we go further, I have to pause to talk about C++ synchronization for programmers who haven't had much experience with it. Using synchronized code always runs the risk of a deadlock situation. That is, too many callers try to access an asset at the same time and keep bouncing off the lock. Sometimes you can bring the application to a halt like that, and sometimes you can bring an entire computer to a halt. This is an area where you want and need to be careful. Let's look at the first way to implement synchronization, as seen here as C Mutex Helper. This class requires that you use your own Mutex class instance, probably like the one that's accompanying this course, and pass it either via the constructor or in a method called use. I've added a try method that you can activate with a precompile definition for purposes of illustration, and I'll get to that in a moment. You can hand a mutex in through a constructor, or you can simply create one using the default constructor and follow it with use. I like to use the try method for a reason that I'll explain later, because it makes your code more flexible. I'm also not necessarily a fan of using the constructor that takes a mutex, because if you fail to get the mutex, you may stay locked. Staying locked is bad. An alternative is to have the constructor throw, which means you have to play a little bit with the code that you write. When you scroll down and look at the lock method, you see why I included try. The precompile symbol try only allows us to write code that throws if it cannot get the lock. Sometimes you don't want to handle things by using exceptions, which is why, in general, asking via the try method is the more flexible way to do things and makes it easier to write your code. So overall, the job of CMutex Helper is a bit like the STL pointer wrappers, to alleviate the need to release synchronization locks when you leave the scope of an enclosing function. It keeps you from forgetting to do it, and that's the greatest danger when working with synchronized code. You can, with the best of intent not to do so, end up locking yourself out by accident. Here are two example synchronized methods. These are more or less safe when called individually, but you should be able to see that they cannot, under any circumstances, call each other. The second method in the call chain, whichever one it is, will try to acquire the lock when the calling method already has it. While you could decide to make the mutex class itself smart enough to allow access from stacked callers, it just adds a layer of complexity to an already complex situation, which is that you're multi-threaded in the first place. When I've been in this situation, I usually write public and private methods for performing these tasks. The public methods, those used by callers outside the class, always use the synchronized interfaces. The private methods assume that the synchronization locks are already in place and just do the work. The public methods call the private methods. Here I've rewritten the synchronized method of the class to call a private work method, which does all the actual work that the outside public interface used to do, but now it does it privately. Anybody inside the class should be calling this after having set up synchronization. Nobody outside can call it so that you can guarantee that the data integrity is maintained. The second approach, deriving from a class that manages the synchronization, I'll illustrate with C Mutex user right here. In this approach, you derive your synchronized class from a base class which implements Mutex or critical section code and use base class methods to lock and unlock the assets. When you use this approach, you'll have to remember to explicitly unlock the asset before your synchronized method completes. There is no way for the base class to detect that your method has gone out of scope, so the lock won't be released until the entire instance goes out of scope. That might be acceptable behavior, depending on how much work you have the synchronized class doing. It's almost always a better practice to release the lock as soon as you've performed a task or a set of related tasks so that other threads requiring that access can get service. Here is exactly what I'm talking about. Called try, we got in, we did the work, now we should be releasing, unless you want to wait for it to happen when the entire class goes out of scope. Usually it's bad practice to do that. 
you might have noticed that I haven't mentioned the C++ Atomic keyword at all. As of C++11, it's still not entirely worked out, a little bit controversial, and in my estimation, it's better to wait to see how the situation solidifies before going into it further. This should be enough to get you started on synchronizing data in C++ to avoid memory corruption. It's a topic full of gotchas and potential pitfalls, and you shouldn't start writing code without thinking about how to design that part of the application first. This area is one of those where you need to think a lot about how to manage data, who needs it, and how to write class interfaces of sufficient granularity to make getting it right as easy as possible. If you think that this is a bit of a dark art, you're right. With enough planning and attention to detail, not to mention some time spent looking up the topic on the World Wide Web, you will be able to do it and well.